All right, good evening, guys. Kenneth Tortoise Capital. This is the Monday or Saturday night podcast for um, November 14th, 2020. We're just going to do some housekeeping Q&A and review some um, traders charts from the chat room. Then I have a couple small uh, Q&A commentaries to, to give. Um, next podcast tomorrow night will be the review of trade frames posted in the chat room. All right, so here's uh, we we got a number from Joel, from Joe uh, today, and then uh, I think one from Pavel. So uh, here is Boeing, and this is uh, minute charts. So we're looking at Boeing and uh, one minute charts, and he's got a. Z3 pinch right here. Not quite a super pinch because you have the RL270 is outside of the outside of the Z3. But we do have a nice a low, a higher low, a third higher low. And he buys this one on the breakout above the uh, uh, of the PSR, and there's the PSR flip, and he's got his Entry at 184.59 with a stop of uh, 26 cents. Um, he's going to end up uh, cashing this at a sniper up here at 185.67, which is a uh, dollar eight on an initial risk of 26. So this should actually be about uh, four R by my amount by by my calculations. Um, he noted also one one eighty four fifty nine. This price was also the previous day's high, uh, and so a breakout from here is a place where swing traders could also be entering. In addition to having the uh, this is really a kata two, and this is the size of the frog box. So you can see he's got a small fraction of the frog box, and that makes it an MMRB or a minimum manageable risk box. And so we get paid the the tighter we can make that risk box, the bigger we can get the gain. So this is about half a box from here to here. So this thing has only moved you know, one half of a frog box on this move. So it's not technically even a signal yet. So it's not a signal. It's not signal until it's moved a full frog box off a measured low. Well, if we look at here, this would almost be a frog box move. So what he's really doing inside here and what we do with the MMRB is that we are willing to start off our trades in the noise, because remember, it's only moved this far off the low from here to there. That's about a third of a frog box off that low. But we're so we are clearly entering in the noise. And after another move of that magnitude, it's moved two thirds of a frog box. He's exiting in the noise. But that trading inside the noise is a plus four R gain. So I really want you to keep that in mind uh, on uh, for later on in the lesson when I start talking about manufacturing R and why what other people consider to be noise or waste or spillage is an area where we can find a lot of value. It's a really important attention to detail mentality. Waste not, want not. And we want to try to live by those rules. So uh, I just, I think that's just a beautiful exit right there, too. Why not? 4R. Uh, this places that inside the larger context of a three-minute chart. So you can see that same blue box. And now this just looks like an orderly... Uh, breakout from the river. Uh, 
So it's not unusual to see uh, on the tighter time frame slightly different patterns because you're zooming in. But even in this pattern, I just want you to notice that the breakout above the dragon and out of the river with the stop uh, just below the Bollinger Band mean still is a reason that's fully justified on the three minute bar. And that the exit that he makes up in here is a one, two, three exit. And so you can still get the same trade, but it's easier to see it on the one minute. Um, but this is, but now you can see why on the three minute, this is, this is really an interesting beginning breakout because now you have a low and a higher low. So you're getting the kata two. And then this was the opportunity that uh, if it, this is where it broke out of the Z3. Notice you had the first big bar, but then failure to follow through. If it was going to follow through, that's where it should follow through because it had cleared all of that resistance, but it didn't. And so that's a good failure to follow through as information. So rather than let this come all the way back to the middle of the river, he cashes a four hour trade. So nice, nicely played. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, we did a two hour practice after the morning session. Um, we had a bunch of the little guys from um, the Futsal Academy from last night came over to play with us um, against the high school girls. And so we scrimmaged seven against four. I was playing with the little guys against the high school girls. And they said it was like playing against the flying monkeys from the Wizard of Oz because these little guys were all over them, all over the place. And you have to learn to play really fast when you're trying to uh, play against 12-year-old boys and a couple girls. But the 12-year-old boys are really quick on their feet and fearless. So I'm feeling it. I'm feeling my age right now. Uh, so on this one, what I want you to notice, this is now looking at the same uh, trade, but looking at dailies. So now what I want you to notice is um, that on the on the daily frame, um, he had identified uh, 184.59 as a really important price level. And so the trade that he made, that 4R trade, was just inside this little space. And if it was going to follow through, 190 would have been the next real test because now you're looking at this, right? Because you had a nice big move up into here, which pulled back to here. It gapped up to here and then sold off. So now that 190 is a really crucial price level in Boeing. After this big run up, 190 feels like the cap. It's like there's a lid on this thing. And so this great big move up was mirrored by this great big move down. And now you had a nice intraday move. It hits this tripwire. And now just from here, just in that little piece, you're looking at a four-hour intraday trade with low risk. The potential was for that thing to go to 190. Could it have? Yeah, it did here. And it did here. So getting this low risk entry at 184.59 opens you to the potential of being in that trade if it decides to go. It's not a prediction, but it wouldn't be surprising if it did. But it didn't. So he takes 4R. So that just looks like a sliver of the daily move. And some people would write that off as, hey, that's just noise. You know, the market really is efficient. What that really means is that it is some percent efficient to the extent that it is uh, a random number generator. But even if it's only 
5% inefficient, inefficient. Uh, instead of writing that off as noise or waste, Joe just showed you how that leads to a intraday for our trade with no overnight risk, and it had the potential for another plus five dollars. And plus five dollars on a twenty-six cent risk make it twenty-five. That's a potential twenty R if that thing were to follow through all the way to one ninety. So he gets four R on a trade that did not follow through in a big way, but was positioned so that that could have been twenty R if it had done an unsurprising move up to one ninety. So you should replay that idea in your head a lot of time. So one person's noise um, is another person's raw material. You know, if you watch the uh, the movie on, I think it's Nat Geo or, uh, you know, Gold Rush, they're starting to run out of ideas. But a lot of the, what those guys are doing is that Back during the gold rush, these guys were using brute force, uh, you know, to to uncover lots of, of earth because there was gold inside those hills. And so, you know, they would wash it away with these monitors, these giant high pressure water cannons, and then they would hit that. And then that mud would run down through uh, through a channel. Uh, and then uh, the gold would drop to the bottom because it was heavier. So they put ripples in there to make that water in slurry oscillate. And then in the oscillation, that would free up the gold from the dirt and the gold would rope to the bottom of the pan and collect in these uh, like sponge-like nettings, almost like steel wool nettings that would trap it. So if you're gonna go that way, uh, you have to make sure that the speed of the water through the runs is just right and that the size of the ripples and the catcher, there's a little, you know, engineer some practical engineering that has to go so you can move thousands of tons of earth through that and then capture the gold that falls to the bottom. Well, what these guys are doing now is they're working to find the gold that these guys didn't get that either washed out or, um, you know, came out the other end of the Salus or in their tailings or were still located in smaller offshoots of those gold veins that run through a mountain that weren't economically suitable for those other guys. And because these guys can be much more efficient, they're finding uh, secondary gold in the tailings and the, and the waste of what other guys did. So they go to places where other miners had found gold. And then what they're doing is making a very nice living on what other people would have thought was waste. So one person's noise or one person's waste can be the raw material for you to make a living on. Waste not, want not. And maybe guys with large size can only play swing trades on daily charts. And so to them, that little sliver of a move may not even get their attention. But we know that there's a four hour trade in there, which could have been 20 hour. And that's only if it went back and been tested the previous swing high. And it could have gone beyond that to 195, which was the previous peak, which would be another 20R if it had done that. It didn't, but we didn't know that on the front end because um, they all looked the same leaving the station. So waste not, want not. Um, all right, here is, I think this is Joe again on solo. <clears throat> Looks like an electric car manufacturer. So this is going to be competing in the world of Tesla, 
and uh, Nikola Motors. So solo. And we've got a um, one minute chart. So this is all intraday. This is what it looks like. Pretend that's a, a beautifully drawn arrow. This is the size of the of the MMRB minimum manageable risk box or how wide this thing oscillates out to Z3 when there's no buying or selling pressure. So somewhere around 50 cents from Z3 to Z3. Uh, and he's noted his frog box for this guy is 20 Five cents and the range stat is 55 cents and a quarter of an ATR is 10 cents. So even a, ten, a little 10 cent box is a, is, should be a manageable risk. And that's a, that looks to be about the size that he's got right here is a quarter of an ATR. And uh, he notices a, you know, I mean, I notice a, a hybrid frog breakout and a Z3 breakout. Uh, a frog box off the low would be right about there or a one, two, three entry. So you wouldn't lose money on that one. And now he's noticing that um, the VWAP, he says one ATR, but it's really the VWAP is providing support and now you get a breakout above um the um this dotted red line for him I'm trying to read what that is i'm not sure what that is looks like a uh, that looks that's a baby dragon that is the um, three period moving average on the RL10. So it's a fast moving average on the price. So if we take the RL10 and we call that smoothed price, then a fast moving average or an MA3 um, is a fast moving average there. So, um, so now this, this breakout is breaking out of the dragon. It's an ATR, a quarter of an ATR off of the um, uh, VWAP. It breaks above that slow moving average, which was sideways. Um, he gets a nice entry and is able to cash. So he, he's taking the first close below the 3MA or RL10. He calls that a change of character. I like that. Um, so I think he, he's taken his exit here. Uh, I would take that really as below that, that the low of that bar that moved out almost to Z3. So it was at about Z 2.5 and then rolled over, could not make a new high and then started to fail. That's a really good exit at 750. And if you're taking an entry, whoops, taking an entry over here at about 640 and you're using conservatively you know uh call it 30 cents that's th that's almost three quarters of an atr if you used half an atr and you're using 20 cents and that would be to the vwap that's not bad so you're capturing from 640 to 750 that's a dollar 10 divided by 20 cents, that's 5.5 R available on a single position. That ain't bad. And then notice once the care, as he calls it, once the character breaks, you get a move all the way back to the VWAP. But look how much that VWAP moved from here all the way up to here. That's genuine value improvement. People uh, were, that means this, there was a lot of volume on this one. One of the things I like to do is to have that volume at price on this side. When you put volume at price, 
you can really see, in this case, you'd have seen a lot of volume being transacted up here in this price level, which is kind of what all this, this great big wave of buying, which was even bigger than the initial volume on the breakout. So there was some real juice inside here. But when that collapses and that buying pressure disappears, you start seeing the bulls taking over. That's profit taking and profit preservation. <clears throat> so uh, this is what 5.5R looks like, managed in the usual way. Um, and then this is uh, so low um, on the one minute. Yeah, okay, that's the same one. Sorry. Yeah, those are all the trades from the from the room. Um, <clears throat> so um, here's what I want to say about um, manufacturing R. So this was a, some comments that Joe made today after this morning's presentation. Right? So he was, uh, Joe was commenting, he was reviewing the idea of uh, long-term growth trades that have huge percentage increases, and he had an aha moment. Most of the time, people aren't thinking about the risk. They just say, hey, that thing went up 110%. So he went and looked at Symbol Shop, and uh, in about um, seven months, it went up 113%, seven months plus 113%. Uh, reasonable risk on that as a swing trade was about 6%. So that is when you do the math. Um, that's about 20 counts that as about 22R. That almost looks a little high to me. Um, I don't think that's right. Let's see, uh, six goes into 113. One, eight, nine. I, I got that at about 19R, but for grins, that's about right. I'll accept his numbers. And that works out to a steady state improvement compounded of uh, 2.7 R per month. If you think about my teachings about 2 R per week as the justification for hybrid trading, that's my goal. Um, you'll realize that that is certainly within you know, 2.7 R per month is within reason. Um, and then supposing if instead of a 6% risk per position, you're risking 1% rather than 6%. And if you just got 50% win rate with three R winners and one R losses, so 50-50 at three to one, and an opportunity of four trades per week, you get to 113% uh, easily without stress. Why? Because instead of trying to find the one symbol that is going to increase that much over the next eight months, fish in a barrel, not even fish in a barrel, I'm trying to needle a haystack, I should say. It's possible to do like Paul Tudor Jones and look for things that offer five or more reasonably. And then with shorter cycles, now you're doing, you can start doing multiple 
uh, multiple uh, trades. Some of them will pay off. Some of them won't. You'll have some kind of, you know, um, that's the trade-off win line. And you just make sure that your losses are not ever greater than one R. And pretty soon you start finding some of these that pay off in a big way, and some of them in a small way, and the occasional big winner. And you start grinding that out, and that gives you a histogram that looks like this. Uh, nothing worse than 1R. Something like a uh, the average win is greater, or the, I'm sorry, the average trade, when you take into account winners and losers, greater than zero, which means positive expectancy. Um, and that out here at 2R, you have something that looks like a, uh, so maybe your average is here, and you have a very normal looking distribution. So that means um, you're not relying on just a few things, your positive expectancy between minus one and plus two. And then you have the possibility every so often of getting a, uh, a greater than 2R win. You want to be exposed to the possibility of fat tails. You get those when the higher time frame acts in your favor. And you don't know what their triggers are. I mean, you could go look at the higher time frame chart, I suppose, and wouldn't be surprised if they saw a critical state when you're in a critical state, like we saw with Boeing on Joe's example. But as long as you're managing this, you're occasionally going to get some of those as long as you are ruthless about not taking losses greater than 1R. And then it becomes a, the law of large numbers. You want many trades so that each little trade only has to do what it does. It's not carrying the load for the whole portfolio. You're not trying to find, aha, that was the one that was going to go to 22R. I knew it. No, you didn't know it. You hoped, but not really. So when we're thinking about a manufacturing process, then uh, we want lots of, uh, we can think about the raw materials and the labor and quality control and process control and efficiency. Um, and then um, we can look at our output stream. And then we can make this whole this whole process very efficient and businesslike and routine and simplify it and treat that as our value chain. And now all of the statistical principles, the stats, those principles um, that give you, uh, great manufacturing, like Toyota, and the Toyota production system, and Lean Six Sigma, and the Shingo model with continuous improvement, by applying these principles that prove to be world class in the world of manufacturing, we are essentially setting up our own manufacturing system to manufacture our and we're looking for those quality raw materials. And if you can be rigorous on the front end and by only accepting trades that are collapsed into that critical state, so you can have a big move in either direction and then tight and then whichever way it breaks out, tightly manage your risk until you can get to no lose plus dinner for two, you just manufactured some amount of gain and then it's a science project to see how much you're going to win. So that's really the insight that comes out of this, uh, out of this, that we're looking, those critical states are going to lead us to trades that wouldn't surprise us if it returned 5R. Don't know that it will, not trying to predict that it will, not going to insist that it will, not going to stick around if it's starting to lose because I have a strong belief that it will give me 5R in the future. No. If it's going to give me 5R in the future, it should look good right from the beginning. 
and start moving in that direction with least amount of stress. And there's so many opportunities to do that. I can be very strict on accepting only those things that meet all of my criteria because there's, uh, there's so many opportunities. I can't even take them all anyway. That's how a selective manufacturer thinks. And then standard business procedures and those principles of standard work. You hear me talking about that all the time, standard work. I have an SOP, I have a gauge and it's calibrated and I'm doing quality control checkpoints on every stage of the manufacturing and supply chain process. That's crucial. <clears throat> so that's why I want to say, uh, I want to say thanks to Joe for teeing that up. Uh, let's see, yeah, it's 847. We have a, we have time for one more lesson, I think. Right, so this is um, from a lecture from the University of Chicago. Uh, let's see, let me get this going here. Yep. And it was a professor that was talking about um, the professional writing that a faculty does. And it was really for academics, but the presenter was talking about just how hard it is to get expert knowledge out of your head and to other people and why the act of writing um, is important and also a way to approach it in order to make the act of writing and education effective for others. And he makes the point that when you're an expert in something, no matter what it is, it's a different kind of writing that you do than a brand new student who is picking a topic to learn how to write, just how to construct sentences. That expert knowledge can often get in the way. And it's the difference between thinking about what is in your head and the rules of writing and to start thinking about the readers. And if you were here this morning, You'd have heard me talking about something like that when um, we were talking about entrepreneurs and the idea of oops. Why is that not working? Let's try it this way. <clears throat> and uh, and the point was, this morning we were talking about how the A grade entrepreneurs were thinking about not how much fun they had with their own little technology and tool, but were using that technology in creative ways to solve problems for others by adopting a customer focus. And so... That was in an interview with a venture capital capitalist. Well, this was um, an interview with a academic writer, but it's the same thing. You know, his point was, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> his point was that expert writers need to stop thinking about the rules of writing and really uh, talk about problems the readers are having that their expert knowledge could help them with. The problems that domain experts have in their writing is getting out of their own head and into the reader's head. Well, I can't read your mind. 
none of us can read each other's mind, but what we can do is do Q&A and dialogue. So we saw some examples of Joe uh, writing about his aha moments and also posting charts. And then those charts and those writings become the basis for a dialogue in which Q&A can occur. And so that works. If you write in such a way that the readers can understand, then you avoid the problem of having the readers have to reread many times or they can't understand or they give up. Uh, readers are looking for things that are valuable to them. And so that's why I continue to solicit you for Q&A and, and charts of you applying the technique so I can see how the fit is. And that will help me become better organized, persuasive, and valuable. <clears throat> so I thought this was interesting. Writing is not communicating my ideas, but about changing the reader's ideas about the world, about what is possible, what is routine. Uh, nothing will be accepted as knowledge or understanding until it's been challenged. Here's how I want you to challenge my assertions is to trade them. Trade those ideas at a level of risk that makes sense. And when you trade them, it is testing the ideas, testing the hypotheses, testing the patterns. You have the competence to make the trades. And so we use some new ideas but also some traditional ones and maybe in different ways. And it's important, not because it's new and original, but because it creates value for you. Yeah, so again, writing is not just to express what is in our head, although in some cases it is, it is but it's about changing each other's thoughts about what is possible and practical. So that's why we'll continue to, to solicit from you um, your questions about the material or express the problems you're having in applying them so that we all can help uh, rough out or uh, grind down the rough edges and smooth it out, and make it fit a little better. All right. So that's everything I wanted to talk about tonight um, to keep soliciting Q&A from you. Looking forward to your trade frames for tomorrow. Um, starting to build up my enthusiasm for starting up the hybrid workshop again. Getting motivated. That's everything I got for tonight. Um, how's the, how'd everything go with class today, Lisa? Uh, how's Kim doing? Awesome. Enjoy the rest of her course. We got one more one more uh, session with her. What like next Saturday? Excellent. All right, guys. That's all I got. Uh, looking forward to seeing you tomorrow and to reading your questions. And Eugene, thanks for that uh, that input on the uh, red road. I was uh, um, I was reading that and thinking about your comment about the compassion plus truth versus brutal honesty. Um, I actually think about that a lot. And I thought about it all the way into Kansas City and through dinner and all the way back out in my little uh, Zen state. My wife is such a good driver that I just, I love relaxing in that car with the heated seat. Man, it gives me a chance to reflect. So take good care, guys. We'll see you tomorrow or in the chat room.